I'm going to tell you about the hidden messages and how to find them, and I'm going to use uh, New Year addresses by Soviet and Russian presidents as an example of place to look for hidden messages. And what are hidden messages and why it's important to look for them? Um, you probably have heard of or dealt with problems where you have large amounts of texts and no idea how to make sense of that large amount of text. And thinking about uh, it would be nice to have a way of kind of pinpointing something there and maybe finding some correlations with something without kind of reading through the whole thing. Um, why New Year addresses are a good example here. Um, so let me tell you about like what are New Year addresses. So each year on December 31st, um, the Le current leader of Soviet Union or Russia gives a short speech. It's a little bit like State of the Union speech, but more with a congratulatory sense in there. Um, it happens each year. It's rather short. It talks about the events of the year, so there is something that you can easily short for correlations with. And after you've dealt with a small exploratory corpus, you can kind of enlarge into larger data. Um, how you get this kind of data? Uh, this is actually a story of how you get a unique set of data. Uh, in order to get some of them, I had to go through uh, the newspapers, the old Soviet newspapers, which were luckily available in this format at the UNC uh, Chapel Hill archives. So I had to go for microfilms, which is my first experience dealing with microfilms. <laughs> <laughs> and was extremely happy that during the Soviet times, the New Year addresses were published in newspaper called Truth, which is all very Aurelian. Um, and of course, the ones which were later in Russian times were available mostly available online. For one of them, I actually searched for a long time and in the end had to reach out to the archives and was actually able to receive the document, the PDF document of what I think is actually the exact um, paper from which this speech was uh, delivered. And there was bald-faced, the places there were, there was international stress in the speech. Okay, before we go into all that, for those who are not familiar with your Russian history, very short course of Russian history. <laughs> um, okay. okay, first, New Year address was delivered in 1970 by Brezhnev. Then, important event, Perestroika, starts in 1985. After that, Soviet Union collapses in 1991. After that, Putin comes to power in the year 2000. And he is a president for all the years since 2000 till now, except for those few years where Medvedev is the president and Putin is uh, premier. Um, so that's your short history, and now let's go into the data. So first would be the qualitative analysis, so this is just word clouds uh, of everything that's in there. Um, of course they were in Russian, and I have translated them. Um, mostly uh, this is just Google Translate, however I looked through it, and for something uh, where Google Translate was doing something extremely stupid. For example, Russian has one word which uh, is translated as both expensive and dear. Uh, translated those all as expensive. However, of course, they were dear friends. So, <laughs> not expensive friends. Um, so, I did check those and correct it. I actually did analysis on Russian and translated for the presentations. Okay, so these are clouds 
uh, which group each four years together. And even from this very simple um, type of analysis, you can already see several patterns. Uh, one of the easy ones, you can see Soviet in the first few, then Soviet disappears, of course, because Soviet Union disappeared, and Russia appears there instead. Um, you can see some other, uh, some other words pop here and there. Uh, Perestroika brings some words with it. Uh, people is an interesting word which we'll talk a lot about starting from now on. So you can see some historical correlations already just from putting words together. However, uh, then I go into quantitative analysis and look at 100 most frequent words in all of the New Year addresses. So here I will be uh, analyzing the following metrics. There will be uh, years uh, as my column, and my 100 most frequent words, uh, oh, my 100 most frequent words as my columns, years as my rows, and each cell which contain the frequency of that word in that year's uh, uh, that year's address, and those frequencies come in IPMs, that's something that linguists like to measure their frequency in, it's items per million, so that means that I took the number of actual, uh, where is the story of why linguists do that? Um, okay, I can tell you the story. <laughs> Um, it happened because historically the first corpus which was produced in Brown University contained exactly one million words. Uh, so the raw frequency in that corpus was actually frequency in one million words. Then other corpora, larger corpora appeared and linguists wanted to compare uh, frequencies in various corpora. And then the simple idea appeared that we can compare it in frequencies in items per million. Um, however, it's um, useful because this way you get a number which I can actually pronounce, something like 5,000 or 4,000. Other way, it would be, if it would be just raw frequency, it would be a very, very small number, like 0. 0.00007. So it would be much less, at least, pronounceable. Okay. Now, raise your hand if you know what PCA is, and if I, when I say PCA, you know exactly what will happen. Okay. <laughs> then, a short description of what PCA is and what it actually does. On an illustrative example. So this is an illustrative example. There is uh, no actual sense in doing that other than explaining <laughs> to you what PCA does. So imagine that um, Someone uh, is drinking tea, coffee, uh, iced coffee, and lemonade in two different weeks. One of the weeks happens in the summer, the other one's happening in the winter. Uh, the hot drinks are in the winter because the person was cold. The cold drinks are in the summer because it was really hot, like in North Carolina. Uh, on weekdays, the person is drinking coffee and iced coffee because they need to work. On weekends, they relax and drink um, lemonade and hot tea. So this is very simple, very understandable table of what's happening. There are days of the week and seasons there. Um, so if we put just words on the receipts, we have our 14 days, we have coffee, tea, lemonade, hot, and iced. And we have zeros and ones for just words, uh, ones for words that were there, zeros for words that are not there. Uh, now we can treat that as a 14th dimensional space with five points in that 14th dimensional space. And we can see uh, how, like, where those five points in 14th dimensional space are placed and we can find the dimension which uh, explains most of the differences. So we can kind of have a plane in our 14th dimensional space. I don't know how's your 14th dimensional imagination, <laughs> but imagine <laughs> a plane in 14th dimensional space. We kind of 
throw it around and find the best plane which explains most of the difference there. Then we can look at this plane and it puts our words and our days on this plane and they group together and of course they do exactly what we would want them to do. Uh, so coffee is around those words which can, uh, days where it was coffee and iced coffee and of course uh, five of them, the summer ones, were closer to iced. Then we have a group of two days near hot tea, a group of two days near lemonade. So they are grouped together according to meaning and we can actually find our uh, main dimensions there. They of course were not there in the algorithm but since we know what was happening we can interpret this and say that okay the one dimension is summer and winter and the other dimension is weekday versus weekend. So very simply this is what um, PCA does and this is exactly what I'm going to do with that 100 uh, words table. Just there will be more words. Okay, so if we put, now we have years and 100 most frequent words and we put them on exactly the same plane, the plane which explains most data and we put just years on them and the first dimension you can easily see puts there the historical um, political era. So all the words to the left, the blue ones, are words uh, after it was Russia, not the Soviet Union. Everything before that, uh, red and purple, is Soviet Union, however purple ones are the perestroika years. So you can see that they grouped really nicely there. Um, the second dimension, uh, interestingly, uh, is closely related to oil and it's actually closely related to economic situation in Russia, but um, finding a good metric for economic situation is hard. Um, one of the reasons is because uh, the statistics, are, economic statistics of Soviet Union is not really reliable. Um, <laughs> however, the good proxy to that is the oil price because the major expert in Russia is oil and gas and 70% of modern Russia's export is oil and gas still. So that is really good proxy to what's happening and oil price and history are known to be really connected to each other. For example, this is the price of a barrel of oil uh, adjusted for inflation. So you can easily see um, Iranian Revolution, Yom Kippur War on this graph, um, Iran-Iraq War on this graph, even the Gulf War on this graph. However, these are events that cause the changes in this graph. However, if we think about Russia, we are thinking more of the um, cost from the cost of the barrel of oil to the economic situation. So the, it's more the other way around. And the important thing happened uh, between the 80s and 90s. This was a huge uh, down for the barrel of oil and one of the reasons of the collapse of the Soviet Union. <laughs> So, I don't have a correlation. Okay. Okay, let me just tell you that um, there is a statistically significant correlation between, let me do that. There is a statistically significant correlation between the price of oil adjusted for inflation and the second, uh, the second dimension on this picture. So the years which are on top are economically good years. The years which are on the bottom are economically bad years. And we see 1991, the year of the collapse of the Soviet Union, among the ones in the bottom. So, so this dimension, these two dimensions, most important dimensions in the speeches, one of them is about political era and the, the other one is about economics. 
Um, okay. And we can put, similarly how we did with iced tea and coffee, the words on the same map and see what words correlate with each of a dimension. And here on the left, remember there was the red years, we have a huge cluster of communist words. So we see here we see things like Lenin's party, socialism, comrade, and things like that, which were frequent in the speeches of those years. While on the other hand, there was Russian years and Russian dimension, we have citizen, Russia, and president, because before the leader was not called president. Okay. Um, and we can see that in the economically bad years, the president seemed to talk about sort of way before us and many things to do, which seems reasonable, while Okay, I'm not going the right way. Okay. Okay, well, in the good years, they talk about like abundance and friends and family. And one of the people who I talked to about this told me they probably wish to talk about this every year, but in the bad years, they feel that <laughs> they have to talk about bad things as well. So I think this is the explanation for this correlation. Okay, so if you just take out some words and leave there uh, just the pronouns, which is you, me, I, we, and so on, you can see that all the pronouns happen to be on that left side, blue side, with the Russian years, and none of them were actually used in the Soviet speeches. The only word that can be comparable to them in terms of Semantics is the word people, which we used in the Soviet times. Um, and this is the, indi the freedom index. Uh, do you know how the economic index is produced? It's like made of uh, several metrics, some of them are based on what's actually happening, some of them based on, on surveys. So very similar index, which is called Freedom Index, it's also based on several metrics, several uh, surveys, and the idea of it, it shows how free the country is, how its democracy is doing. So this is the Freedom Index for Russia in the years that we were interested in, and it's very explainable, and it uh, relates very closely to the change of leadership. So here we see Brezhnev, nothing changes. Then comes Gorbachev, who was the leader of Perestroika, and freedom goes up. Then comes Yeltsin, who came after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and freedom goes up again. Uh, then Putin was actually on exactly top of that curve, but for some reason moved down due to the power shop, uh, <laughs> PowerPoint reasons. But he's actually, the year 2000, where he arrived exactly on top of that curve. Then where's Medvedev, then it goes up again, and then Putin arrives again, and it goes down. <laughs> so, uh, in addition to those uh, two dimensions, two major dimensions which explain things, we can look at dimension number three, with dimension number four, and so on. And two of the dimensions in this, um, I think there are dimension five and dimension six, actually correlate, one of them correlates with freedom index and one of them correlates with change of leadership. So we can actually predict for just looking at new year addresses. Is that freedom index relative or did it really drop like 60 points in like five years there? Because uh, it goes from 90 to 30 very, very quickly. Yes, it went from 90 to 30 <laughs> very, very quickly. And that's a sad story. Um, and the words that correlate with one or the other are task and way. Do you think which one is the democratic one? Yes. <laughs> so we talk about the way in front of us. 
during the more democratic years. And then we talk about tasks. And the word people, which we saw, was kind of the, um, the only um, thing that was used instead of the per, per, um, personal pronouns in the Soviet Union years actually has a negative correlation with the Freedom Index. So the more word people is used, the less freedom is there and the other way around. So the use of um, uh, word people goes down around 2000s, the Freedom Index goes up and then with Putin years, it reappears back. So together with the uh, uh, state of the country, there comes state of mind. Did you do any combinations for like citizens and people, or would they all would they become the same word? But when you're doing your analysis, you know, if somebody mentioned citizen as and and a person or people, uh, would that become the, the, same, the same actually not the citizen because the citizen uh, is um, the word which we uh, start from their new year address after it became Russia so before um, yeah because before it was mostly friends but then it became citizens and that's just standard way they start so I don't think citizen would be correlating with this it would be just mostly correlating with before Soviet Union, after Soviet Union collapsed. Okay, other two dimensions correlate with something that Russians care a lot about, war and peace. There is one which correlates with whether there is war during that year, and another one which correlates with the, if the war started that year. And I actually used the one which predicts um, uh, whether there is war that year in order to predict for uh, 2016 using the first 2000, uh, the f uh, first, and unfortunately was correct. <laughs> um, and yes, um, during wars, they talk a lot about history. That's an important word there. Um, during the peaceful time, they talk more about citizens. Um, so these are um, the dimensions I've been able to find. I was really excited to find them there, find the correlations with those historical events, political events, um, and was just excited about the fact that just from 100 words, you can see all that and you can find correlations with all that. That's it. So, Aaron, while you come up and get set up, is there any questions for Julia? Yeah, I'm going to start with that. You talked a lot about, I mentioned two, but you cannot recommend that. Did you have a slide that showed that I had correlation? No, I actually have it, but for. Okay, first, I'm repeating the question. The question was if I have a slide okay. that has the correlation with uh, economics. I do have it. I can pull it off. It was not in this presentation for some reason. Would you like me to pull it off from another presentation? Okay. Julie, are you willing to share your presentation? Sure. I can do that. Oh, sorry. That would be another one. And you're on. Jeannie, definitely. So, other questions for Julia? Yes. So, I mean, you can scoot over to the I don't want to mess up your, well, no, mess up your laptop more than anything. Is that actually, oh, it isn't there. How is that Okay, so I'm repeating the question. The question is the uh, oil price is going down right now, and how is that uh, affecting um, what's happening? Actually, there are several economists who were sort of hopeful because of oil prices going down that uh, Putin's regime will become less stable. <laughs> <coughs> Yes. 
Um, I watched a uh, TensorFlow presentation last year, and it was about taking speech from um, job requests from to try and correlate price of uh, a role or a position with the words that they use. And I wonder, the, the question for you is, I wonder if you consider machine learning or deep neural networks that would correlate the surrounding words instead of, um, you know, because I think some of those words in context you might understand, for example, people and, and uh, uh, less freedom from the, con the surrounding context of the words and grouping words together. And I don't think your principal component analysis can, can do that when it looks at each word individually, right? Okay, so the question is whether I considered uh, using neural networks or other algorithms that would look at combinations of words instead of individual words. I have not. I agree that it would be extremely interesting and we could find interesting patterns. I am still amazed that you can find a lot in the just first 100 words. Sure. Yes. Uh, was there any uh, um, confusion or, or difficulty in finding uh, discriminating between the, the use of the word uh, soyuz when it, when it might relate to the Union, uh, the country, so for the Soviet Union, versus the spacecraft. Uh, back, back when the Soyuz, back when the Soyuz, the Soyuz program was, was one of the highlights of their technology. Okay, so the question was, was there a problem with discriminating the word Soyuz, which was the name of the space, uh, spaceship? as opposed to Soyuz, which was the part of the country's name. I don't think I've seen the mention of Soyuz in the New Year addresses. They talk about the programs, but it would be like, we've uh, succeeded in our lunar program, okay. and that would be it. So one more question, and then we're going to turn over to Aaron. Can you look into what are the words can predict what there will be more in the next year? Uh, the question is, where are the words predict uh, if there will be war in the next year, and yes, I did. And the prediction for 2016, unfortunately, was correct. <laughs> Thank you so much, Julia.